I think anybody that has been to a, a developing country and has walked around the city has an experience of being in this bustling road with vendors on its side that are providing anything that ranges from food to clothes to handcrafts, uh, jewellery, uh, you name it. We are referring to um, entrepreneurs that are providing uh, legitimate products and services but that do not comply with, uh, with some of the regulatory uh, requirements. Perhaps they don't have a permit, uh, they don't have a, a registration of the business. Uh, that is what we talk about when we talk about the informal economy. There's often a confusion between uh, informality and criminal activities and that leads sometimes to some terminology like the shadow economy or uh, you know, something that, that sort of highlights perhaps the negative. It's about 60% of all global employment. <laughs> it's quite a large portion. Uh, of economic activity. In some regions of uh, Asia and Africa, this is uh, up to about 80 or 90 percent. In many cases, in many regions, in many countries, it is the economy. So we're talking about the majority. What I want to stress is really the diversity of the informal economy. It's not just one type of activity. Uh, it is as diverse as the formal economy and it's not only present in developing countries, it's also present in high income countries. So we are now experiencing the space where um, freelancers and the gig economy, sort of high skill uh, individuals, are also um, engaged in informal activities, providing all sorts of um, consulting, uh, research, um, creative activities also informally. So I think we have to acknowledge first and foremost how diverse it is and how it manifests in different regions and in different contexts. big tech companies that have started in garages and basements <laughs> informally, um, just as an example. But you know, we, we have um, uh, from fashion trends that start informally and they are widely spread in society to cultural and other, other um, uh, new ideas that I think drive society in many other ways that start informally. that value is, has to do with looking beyond not only the figures on employment, how many people are employed uh, and how much of the GDP is contributed by the informal economy, but also looking at other contributions that the informal economy does, social value, uh, cohesion, social cohesion, uh, being its entry point and source of livelihoods for, for uh, disadvantaged communities, innovation. Don't be blinded. 
by the massive excitement of space because it's more within reach than you might re might realize. The reality is it is really, really improving the lives of every single person down on the, on the planet. There are so many space applications that really affect our everyday lives, literally from the moment we wake up in the morning, we check the weather forecast, 99.9% .9 of the data that goes into a weather forecast is from space. Over 50% of the things that we have to measure to even understand climate change can only, only be taken from space. We hear of developing countries who are literally leapfrogging the copper wire generating and going straight to connectivity using satellites, enabling uh, telebanking, telemedicine, enabling rural communities to join the modern world, quite simply. Scientists recognize that you could correlate when that when you were going to get an outbreak of that disease if you had a very high appreciation of water levels over a very, very wide view. And they also realized that the only way you could get that kind of perspective was from space. So we ran a program where there was um, satellites being tasked with monitoring those water levels in Vietnam. They could then correlate that to where you were going to get uh, mosquito outbreaks, and they could then correlate that to where you were going to get a disease outbreak. Now, what's the value of this? The value of this is they were able to get a six-month lead-in time on when you were going to get those disease outbreaks, and that meant they were able to put in place um, mobile health facilities to make sure they could manage the disease. Space operating environment is getting increased, we call it increasingly contested, increasingly congested. It's just busier, right? <laughs> We're a victim of our own success. And I think most people think about space and they think about, you know, this huge, huge infinite entity, which of course it is. Um, but the bits we use of space are much more finite. So I often talk about them as, as like ring roads around major cities. Um, and, you know, the key ring road, the low Earth orbit, um, is becoming increasingly populated. At the moment, once a mission is launched, you know, it's fueled, it's launched, that's that, right? You have no possibility to refuel. It's like buying a brand new car with a full tank of petrol and driving that car. And when the petrol runs out, you go, okay, that's it. Can't use that car anymore. What we're seeing now is new um, developments in that space sector where we're looking at refueling capability. We're looking at uh, the ability to fix satellites in space. So that's going to be really important to develop that capability alongside developing any manufacturing capability. to mostly be thinking really in English, maybe in German, maybe in French, uh, in terms of the availability of these tools. But 
if I was to use just African continent, uh, for example, we have 2000 plus languages. And in being able to get people to communicate, to share ideas, or even be able to think about financial inclusion, education, health, uh, we kind of will miss a whole part of the world just because we would only be moving towards a few languages. Some of the work that we do at the university is in trying to battle misinformation. And a, a, a big challenge there at the moment is a lot of the social media platforms cannot actually build automated systems to flag suspicious content in local languages. So if that can't happen, it means that the adversary, so the person who's trying to spread misinformation, simply needs to switch into local languages in those areas so that they can spread that bad information. In the same way we want the diversity in languages, it means that we have to build up diversity in the people building the tools. A big thing I'm very passionate about is then building up more and more people working on AI on the African continent. If you don't spend the time to actually build up tools that make it easy for people to just be able to use their language, then it's always an extra step that you have to do to think in that language or do things in that language. And then this becomes a barrier for the overall development of that language in 2024, in 2034. There's a transformational impact of having a community of people who think like you, instead of feeling like you're always an outsider, right? Of, of, oh, I need to work in English because that's what the rest of the field is doing. But in this case, you can work with other people who are like, oh yeah, we have the similar problem, but I'm from South, well, like South or Latin America, or from Southeast Asia, and these are the types of languages that I'm working on. And that is a net plus right, uh, for humanity in general. At our lab at the university, we had invested some time on working on Setswana, working on Shitsonga, and we'll be working on other languages um, in the South African sphere and building up tools for things like news classification, entity recognition, and being able to do that and show people that it's possible through innovations in the way that we collect data. I don't want Africa or Latin America or Southeast Asia to just be a place where data comes from. It has to be a place that is innovating, building their own systems, and through that really uh, building up their economies, uh, uh, creating more social safety nets and, and new opportunities, especially for young people. I like to describe myself as a lawyer and still a human being. I guess with the advances in technology, being a human being becomes more important. And my work revolves around using technology and innovation to bridge the access to justice gap by making the law available to underserved communities across Africa. As a child, coming of age, you know, starting to develop memory. For me, it was memory of conflict, you know, hiding in corridors and sleeping in bushes. 
and, uh, and we fled. We fled from that area after some time to the capital city. But questions for me of how society could break down to start resolving, to start resolving problems through conflict are questions that always uh, intrigued me as a kid. The law is a tool to enable us to discover the best versions of ourselves. When there is a difference or when there is a variance between the law and ourselves, that's when conflict arises. What Barefoot Law does is uh, we bridge the access to justice gap between people and the legal system through the use of technologies. And uh, we do this using multiple technologies from the most basic, like mobile phones, to a bit more complicated technologies like the internet and artificial intelligence. The model is simple. The first step of access to justice, or the first step in making the law readily available, is to overcome ignorance. So access to justice starts with access to the provision of information that people will use and digest. The next step is people in those communities that have legal problems contact us pro bono through the same channels and our team of trained lawyers then guides them towards resolution while at the same time creating agency such that the same people we've helped today are people that tomorrow will be agents of justice in their communities and use that knowledge to prevent and resolve problems in their communities without necessarily coming to barefoot law. For instance, on SMS, you type law, space your question, and send that to 6115. That will come to our team of trained lawyers who will be able to guide you. And that service is available in five languages in three countries across Africa. This intervention very basic and very simple as it seemed, was able to give them not only agency, but along the years, it was able to restore their dignity. And seeing them walking around proud for me was a, was a fulfilling moment because that's not something we would ordinarily capture as impact. When we went to the sun, I out of curiosity asked him, how did you get in touch with us? And he showed me <laughs> a basic phone and I found that unbelievable because this is someone in a hut with a tiny solar charger on the roof, charging a basic phone and using that to access justice for his mother. I found that unbelievable. And I would never have imagined something like this extending to a person like that. believe the power that technology gives us is a power to twist the narrative. It's not a global north, global south thing anymore. There's a certain decentralization in practice, a decentralization in innovation that enables lessons from the global south to not only come to the global north but to benefit the world. And I believe Barefoot Law is one of those examples of a million other examples, not only across Africa but across the world. <music>